This is an assault I'm making love in the name Gia, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The way she moved, the way she used her face, the way uh, her, sometimes her face would be a little crooked, like her, her mouth. I mean, uh, it, sometimes it was a little tough. Sometimes it would be whatever the spirit was. And it gave back to uh, the picture something much more interesting. And there's no cookie cutter Gia no form uh she uh was her own form without knowing make me chase you make me chase you Jeez, geez, geez. Mm. nice his words the makeup and the clothes all add up to the illusion of readily available sexuality look at me like you're naked that's it Fabulous. look right through this is not so much a profession Maybe. but a roulette game where your beauty, your look, is gambled every day. You either break the bank or get broken. If you don't have the luck that your look is in that day, you're through. You can try to learn how to win at this game, but like roulette, winning just happens. Once you make it, you become a member of an exclusive international club where the sun always shines, the parties are glowing, a land where there's no ugliness, no sickness, no poverty. A land where dreams come true and everyone is certified beautiful. The light at the end of the tunnel is the action of Europe and Paris. Here, the fashion showing of Immanuel Kahn. When you become a member of the European Model Club, the work is plentiful and fast. But fast sometimes gets to be frantic. Okay, I started out in London, then I went to Madrid, then I went to... London again, then I went to Milan, then I went to London, then I went to Milan, then I went to Dusseldorf, then to Madrid, then to Lanzarote. Romance is out of the question. People don't look at you with the idea of a lasting relationship because they think that you're just going to be here for a short time and that's what they expect from you. I think it's a fantastic business for about five years to meet people and to make money and to travel. But it's very difficult to stay sane. It's very difficult not to either start drinking too much champagne or to take too much cocaine or anything. It's very difficult, as he can put the words in my mouth, to keep your self-respect. Yeah. And uh, as soon as this camera went on, the first thing I thought, is the light nice? Huh? Yes, now, am exactly. I going to say anything interesting, but is the light nice? There's absolutely nothing. 
but fantasy and getting off, somehow getting off, making people sit up and watch, making people applaud, which is wonderful. But you can't live like that all your life. Self-respect, or the lack of it, is something that models continually worry about. Many say that being paid a fortune for what is essentially unskilled labor is ultimately unfulfilling. Their careers seem to go in cycles of anxiety. John Casablancas, head of the Elite Agency in New York. When success comes, they have a moment where they appreciate it very, very much, but it's very, very short. I think they get spoiled incredibly fast and go through like a crisis where they think that everything is owed them. It's a very natural reaction in a way. You know, they get too much too quickly. I just kind of knew, I guess, somewhere inside of me that she would not live a long life. All the times that she had OD'd, why didn't God take her then? Why did she have to go through everything? You know, she wasn't spared anything. Gee, when you got out here being photographed, you not only looked different, you acted different. You became a different individual. What's the process? I mean, you, when you're having your photograph taken, do you think of yourself in a different way as you project to the camera? Uh, I have to. It's, you know, that's what I do. It's a job. I mean, I'm modeling. So I have to project what I am at that time. What were you at that time? Well, whatever your eyes want to see. I mean, I, I'm... The fashion model. When you came in, you were Gia, and you were yes. rangy, and you were walking loose, and when you got into this, you became a cat, you became a feline, you became a lady. That's how I do my job. <laughs> Look up here in my camera. Right in. Beautiful like that. Great. Wait, please come in the light a little bit. Now, look into the light with your head. Turn your head into the light. And chin yeah. down, chin down, into the light. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Turn, turn, turn your head. Get the light. Oh, you okay, can't. Okay, that's beautiful like that. Now, you got a nice framing of it now? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Tell me when you want me to go. Oh, you have no. to get speed and everything. You got speed? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, beautiful like that. Great like that. Chin down, eyes into my camera. You almost destroyed you, didn't you? Um. And you thought more than once about packing it in, didn't you? Yes, I did. I guess you could say that I did. Yes, I have. Um, but I thought about that also without drugs. I mean, now I have a great lust for life, you could say. And I love life. And it's a wonderful feeling. And I think that I had to go through that in order to have this feeling that I have for life now. I mean, that's how I feel right now. why she took up with what she did and why she ended up the way she did was some self-destructive thing that was in her and you could feel that when you were with her you f that was the vulnerability that was her sensitivity to everything around her that was what put me many times in tears when i was holding her 
Nobody. Nobody. I don't care who it is. Especially a mother should ever see what I saw. I remember her in the end when she broke out in pimples and she had track marks on her arms and her fingernails were all bitten and her hair was falling out and she had black and blue marks because she was trying to hurt herself, trying to kill herself. It's a very, very sad, tragic story. I keep thinking how that beautiful, beautiful girl must have just wasted away with AIDS. And that horrifies me. What do you think killed Gia? Uh, lack of love. Lack of love. She, uh, she never seemed to be able to find the people that could give her the love that she needed, the specific kind of love that she needed. It's hard to make the difference between what is real and what is not real. The photographer, Chris von Wagenheim, who was at the peak of his career at that time, was intensely riveted to her. He was gone. He just couldn't take his eyes off. The camera, click, click, click. I mean, there was, you see the movie, The Eyes of Laura Mars? This girl did it before the movie. I mean, she really, really was amazing. You just looked at her. It was this presence that was so unlike anybody else. So unlike anybody else. In private life, she was very simple and she never wore makeup, she never cared about anything, and then with the light, she would just, she would just... Stay just like that, Gia. Stay like that till I can, can shoot. It's beautiful like that, Harry. Fabulous. Beautiful like that. Great. Great like that. Move slow. Not fast, no... For the period, the brief period of time that Gia was on top of her profession, she was at the very top. She was way beyond anyone. How long was that? a year or two it was it was like that I've used for many years um, binoculars little binoculars so that I can focus on what the camera sees and get a close-up view because Scabula was using a long lens and to my horror um, I saw her arms she was very thin at the time as well and there were track marks this one time she showed up to the shooting with tons of track marks and um, it was just really hard to cover them and uh, really hard to photograph her because um, you could only do it by certain angles. I think they were on her arms and uh, parts of her legs. I knew by what she was saying, having been there myself, that this girl was using a lot, a lot, a lot of heroin uh, and that she was doing it a lot more frequently than people thought she was and that she was frightened kind of creeps up on you and catches you in a world that's, you know, none that anyone will ever know except someone that has been there. Here we are in the land of make-believe, right? Fantasy. Fantasy, okay. So. Dreams come true. It's real hard. It's, I mean, you feel sorry for these girls? It's mentally, it's a lot of strain on your mind. I remember touching her face and putting on eye makeup and thinking, my God, it's like you don't need anything. I guess I do look different than when I came in here, don't I? Her features are so perfect. Was in the, uh, a building on 53rd Street, I can't remember the name, a big modern building. And we were shooting, and now that I'm thinking, my, excuse me, it was Italian Bazaar. And she made such an impression because the girls I was working with that day and just came in and they were these pretty cute sweet girls and we made them up and everything and she came in and all of a sudden I see I had these black punk glasses on that day wrap around kind of weird punk glasses all of a sudden I see this girl's come in she's got a feet up on the table uh, she's smoking and she's wearing my glasses and I, I, you know, I just turn around and look at her, and I mean, she had presence, enormous presence. And uh, I was furious with her because she slapped on some ugly kind of cheap foundation. And I remember thinking, why'd she do that? Doesn't she trust me to be able to do her makeup? Or, uh, so I got a little uptight with her. And 
that day, and I still have the photographs from that day, uh, it was for Italian Bazaar. It was extraordinary. She um, did the most powerful uh, dress in a black one shoulder off the shoulder dress and there she was and let the strap down and she like one breast was hanging out and I mean she was but so hot so cool and so sexy particularly cool she had a really interesting ex uh, she wiped out every other girl that was there that you only could pay attention to Gia I started working with very good people you know, and a lot of work, I mean, all the time, very fast. I didn't build into a, into a model. I just sort of became one. She actually created a style, which is difficult to do. She created, um, <laughs> I mean, this big camel hair coat that she would, it's kind of like a garbo. You know, a guy, a garbo, kind of garbo-esque figure. I mean... To have every editor in New York City just want to work with Gia to see what she looked like that day. Who else? Name somebody. Cindy is gorgeous, drop dead gorgeous. Nobody cares what she's wearing. Um, that may not sound important, but to people whose business it is fashion, you have to work with Gia. You obviously love your work. You're good at it. One of the top supermodels are you so much in love with it that when it is inevitable that it can't be any longer what are you gonna do oh no I mean I love my work I love the people I work with I love making beautiful photographs but I never just wanted to be a model I mean it's, it's never been a dream of mine I just sort of fell into it she really never came to peace with being um, perhaps the first in a generation of supermodels. I think all the idolatry and the praise and all of the attention was very fleeting and she seemed to know that. Somehow within Gia she knew that all this was just a temporary thing. And perhaps in a way she was wiser than most of the others and that was reflected in her, in her very outrageous behavior in her um, trying to provoke and shock everyone, probably was a deep sense of intelligence and maybe, maybe in some strange way, an understanding, an inherent understanding of this industry and how it uses people and, you know, swallows them up and spits them out. And I think perhaps Gia knew that going in. You can walk away from it just like that. Well, I, I wouldn't say that you just walk away from it. I mean, I do love it, you know, and, and it's a fantastic career. I don't know what killed her, I mean, but I know that there, there was a sadness. There was something that was eating her inside, always. And that one thing maybe took different form. And uh, it, it was a certain emptiness at first. And then the emptiness turned into, um, into the addiction. And then the addiction cured it became a disease so there was something inside there that was stronger than all of the rest and that somehow was eating her you know it was just it was hard to get to know Gia it was really hard to get to know her. she didn't let you in you know she didn't let you come into her uh, into herself I did you know, just try to chat with her. Um, yeah, she chatted back, but not a lot. She's a very unpredictable, emotionally unpredictable person. Where one moment, everything could be fine, and the next moment, you know, there could be an emotional storm. Everybody liked Gia. Um, they also were scared of Gia. Um, like I said, they didn't know what she was going to do, ever. She put on this red string bikini, walking next to a horse. Forget Bo Derek and Ten, forget it. I'll never forget this visual. The sun's going down, the waves are coming in, and Gia just, one minute she was being a real punk, like, yeah, hey, Janice, come on, let's go drink some tequila, let's go get the chips, let's go pick up some Mexicans. I'm like, Gia, yeah, we're doing Vogue. This is Vogue, honey. 
she was so vulnerable and, and so easily hurt by people and uh, I hated to see her hurt. I hated to see her hurting herself and uh, it was hard for me because it was like a heartbreak all the time for me. I knew she was hurting herself. I knew she was having problems living. Yeah, I mean this is looking back but I think there was probably something very sad in her life. She wasn't explicit about what happened but there was definite, definitely the sense that it, there was an ab abnormal kind of sexual tension between she and her father and it was I, I'm, I'm really not sure whether they actually had sex or they didn't have sex but there was Did you ever hear the song, I'm a girl watcher, mm -hmm. I'm a girl watcher, here comes one now? Well, that was Gia's anthem. I mean, she was always looking for beautiful women. Gia had a desire for women that was so, in its essence, masculine. I mean, Gia really, you know, I've worked with a lot of people with all kinds of different sexual orientations over the years. And working with lesbian women... You know, there's just certain strong feelings that you get when you listen to them talk about their passions and their desires. The thing that was always so disconcerting about Gia was, whenever I would kind of tap into what she was telling me in a session about her sexuality, it was so much closer to the way that men talk about women. Just the whole vibe, the whole feeling. There was a quality about her that very, very many times, and I remember that my wife had said this too, uh, that more than anybody else, I felt like I was in a room with James Dean. You know, there was like that kind of, uh, that very kind of brooding male, young male quality to her. And she loved women. Gia was very feminine and also very butch at the same time. It was a very sort of interesting mix. Um, she just had a beautiful way about her that was a little on the masculine side, like a swagger. She used to come to my house, and I'm telling you that it looked like Johnny Depp. It did not look like a girl. It looked like a cute, gorgeous Italian guy that I had dated when I used to live on Staten Island. It did not look like a, a model? No way. Can you imagine me walking down the street with a gorgeous model? It just wouldn't work. She looked like a guy a gorgeous guy no one can imagine that but she did I'm sure other people could see that she was wearing a uh, old beat-up trench coat with uh, sort of a pair of khaki pants and work boots and a button-down shirt from Brooks Brothers with no bra no makeup her hair just dried however it dried after she washed it and she looked sort of very plain to me you know she looked pretty but I remember walking in with her to this club and just everybody just looking at her she knew she was beautiful she had the best tits in the business she could make them jump up and down she was gorgeous she was inventive she was a bad boy and that was very alluring in those days and that's why everybody wanted her so here we are, we're both nude, we're both climbing this fence, the music is blaring, we're dancing, we're being photographed, we're feeling fabulous, we're looking gorgeous and all this and that. But she was thinking I was meaning it, which I, I was doing something in those days I used to get in front of any camera, just jump in front of a camera and act out scenes. At the end of the day I took my makeup off and went home. And she went home and called me up and said, would you like to go for a ride in my car? And all of a sudden I went, uh-uh, wait a minute. Did she think I meant anything? You know, like, 
I said, Gia, you know, I really like you and everything. You're beautiful. I said, but I don't like women like that. And I could tell when I was giving her the answer, she was blowing it off already. She didn't take any notice of anything I was saying. She said, oh, I have this gray car or something. Like, I don't know what she said, but it was like really like a 19-year-old kid would say to her. I mean, I was like 29 or whatever. And I just thought, oh, my God, I've got this isn't happening. And then sure enough, that night or the next day, I got roses. And I was, ooh, now what do I do? Uh, to me, it was funny, but Gia had no sense of humor about anything like this. None. Zero. But she did not care about my sexual preference or didn't even enter her mind. We used to hang out with the same people, like a photographer, Andrea Blanche, Ariella, another photographer named Bruce Lawrence that I used to see a long time ago. And he had a party, and we wound up in his party, and all of a sudden, the music was playing, and blah, 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 and all of a sudden, she kissed me. The thing that irritated her is that she knew that I sort of wished that she was a guy. Did she make you question your own sexuality? No. No, she always knew I was straight. As a matter of fact, main thing she problem she had with me probably was sex <laughs> I never wanted to hurt Gia, ever. And this is kind of really, really personal, what I'm saying, because she, um, she was so adorable and so charming and so much of a pleasure to be with that even though I knew this was going to be complicated, I was going to be there. And I was there. And it was complicated. There'd be straight women who would fancy Gia and not know that they fancied Gia. I don't think she cared if they were gay or straight. She just went after women that she found beautiful. A friend of mine had come back from a, a shoot in Barbados with Gia on the trip, and she called me hysterically crying that Gia had sexually attacked her and that she didn't know how to handle it and, you know, was really freaked out about it. And Actually, I think she left the shooting early because of this scene um, I thought it was kind of funny I, I wasn't like afraid of her physically but there was something about her that was scary I mean there were moods there were angers mood swings and of course I didn't know about the drugs I knew that we all did drugs at parties and I knew that we were but I didn't know the extent that she was doing the drugs which contributed to her mood swings, although I'm pretty sure she was moody anyway. When we decided we had a problem, I think a lot of it was passed off as the Bowie episode and the influence of that. Uh, she liked to go out and stay out all night, and we, we just couldn't get her to behave. Any drugs in her life at that point? She experimented, and we knew that there were several episodes of that. I had her, um, I had rushed her to the emergency a couple of times and had them run tests on her, and then they told me on one occasion, what are you going to prove she's going to have X amount of cocaine or something in her? What are you going to do? You have a problem, take her home, take care of it. When I 
hear people say, well, her mother did this or her mother wasn't that or her mother. And I think, oh, my God, if only they knew how difficult this girl was. She was really difficult. Do you think you ever fell in love with her? Yeah, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did because there was a point when I can consciously and in those days I was not conscious that often. I can remember saying, I know this is how it's going to be played out, that she's going to be a big star, I'm going to be a nobody in the background, but if it makes her happy, I'll stay with her. I knew that the thing that made her happy was that she had me emotionally. Right into the lens down there. That's it. Beautiful. Like she that. became erratic. In time, her work was affected. At one point, you got kind of into the drug scene, didn't you? Um, yes, you could say that I did. Um, the heroin was actually, in those times, a party drug. It was just like Coke and Quaalude. There'd be the most elegant parties in the world. I'd be in beautiful townhouses, and they'd be serving heroin. And we always snorted it. And that was pretty common. But I'd never shoot it up. I had no interest in needles. And it wasn't like th that ser It was too serious for me. It was too much of a street drug. And no, I never shot it up. And then one day in my apartment, I can remember Gia kind of grabbing me. And her eyes looked like wild. They were like dancing. They looked like flames. And she just grabbed me and she said, she had a syringe in her hand and she wanted to shoot me up with it. And I said, you're out of your mind. She absolutely wore me down and wore me out. I was anorexic at the time, about 80 pounds, and it was easy to wear me out. But I, all of a sudden I just said, go ahead, do it. And she shot me up and I passed out for about 16 hours. You're free of it, aren't you now? Oh yes, I am definitely. I wouldn't be here right now talking to you if I wasn't. When I found out that she had died of AIDS, I was, of course, um, hysterical for my own life and hysterical grieving over hers. But then I had to have the AIDS test and this and that, and I had a pretty miserable couple of years thinking that I had AIDS. Um, she wanted to take me with her on the ride that she was on. Francesco, do you remember where you were or what you were doing when you found out that Gia was HIV positive? No, I know it was a phone call and I know I thought, oh my God, she kicked the habit. She got over that terrible thing and now she has AIDS. And I just started crying. Because I thought, my God, after all she went through. Do you feel any anger towards her? Oh, I, I'm sure I wanted to call her, you fucking bitch. How could you do that to me and all this and that? But, pff, you know, she didn't know. She didn't know she had AIDS. Do you think the industry used Gia longer than they should have, considering her condition? Yes, they did. Um, she was a mess. She was a total mess. I can remember waking up one morning feeling like someone beating me over the head i'd been out with her that night and she'd been awake all night i realized when i saw her, she didn't even sleep that night and she just looked at me and she said sam should i go into work today and i said no not if you feel like i do please do not go into work today when you're a junkie you have to be high to perform um so anytime she was booked Anytime she showed up, she was stoned. No matter what she said, she had to be, otherwise she'd be sick. I have pictures of her where you see the, 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 the unhappiness, where you see the, the, the torment. She was a tormented soul. People said to me, you should have let her go to work. We would have taken care of her once she got there, okay? She could never, ever get off the circle, and it was a really vicious circle. Um, it's too bad they didn't do it intentionally, but they did not realize that she had to be high to be there. They knew that she was using. They knew that she was screwing up jobs. They knew anecdotally, and, and the stories had a kind of acute twist to them, you know, oh, Gia did it again, and so on. Back in the Wilhelmina days, she was not using heroin. She was... She was not alone because she had the, she had the attention of Wilhelmina. Willie made time for her. 
I suppose you could say Willie was a surrogate mom to her. The death of Wilhelmina began her, her heroin addiction. I remember because I was there. Wilhelmina was a very important influence on your career and your life. Yes, she was very important. She helped me when I had just started. I mean, as a friend, she helped me. And as an agent, she helped me. And she was extremely intelligent. And um, she was this great person to have in my life on a business level, as well as feeling uh, personal feelings towards her. She was just a tremendous woman. And her death must have been a terrible loss to you. Yes, it, 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 it was a terrible loss to me. And I, I still, you know, I regret it terribly. You know, I just, uh, I mean, things are meant to be, and I just hope that her soul is where it should be. It was suggested to me by the owner of Wilhelmina that maybe I would see Gia uh, in a kind of counseling relationship because apparently she was having some difficulties with drugs. Um, it wasn't really defined to me a whole lot more than that. <clears throat> I knew it was hard drugs. Um, but other than the fact that uh, I, I had heard these anecdotal stories almost on a daily basis and that I'd heard she was gorgeous, um, I had not ever met the woman. I only met her when she came to see me as a counselor one afternoon in my wife's office. That's how it all began. What kind of drug are we talking about now? At the time, uh, she was using heroin. If I know, but I am definitely, I definitely, uh, I'm going to school for cinematography and I plan to, uh, make a big, big splash in film someday with my films as a cinematographer. My favorite uh, cinematographer is uh, Victorio Stor Storello, is his name? Stor, Stor what is his name? Stor Stor Storero, 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 Victorio Storero. He, he made Reds and he made, what else did he make? Uh, he works a lot with uh, Bertolucci. But I know you want to get down to business, so. <laughs> no. no, I'm just a little bit crazy because uh, Jeff here has been telling me that I shake too much, that my nerves are bad, but that's just because um, I still haven't finished my growing pains. But as soon as I do, I'll be fine. And then I'm going to take you on the road and show all you motherfuckers what I can do. But until then, you know. What can I say? My skin looks bad, doesn't it? But it's okay. Just a little uh, scrubbing. Go to the health spa. Or I'm joining the health spa. I'm joining the health spa. And you know, people, models that are with elite, they get a discount of like a uh, 3% discount. <laughs> no, but it, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, so that's life in the big city. And uh, good dude. <laughs> she definitely kept people at a distance. Yeah. Um, she, it almost, it was almost like she was afraid too to let somebody in. This girl was just extraordinary. She really had me in the palm of her hand. She never sat still for a minute. She was up and down, sitting on the desk in front of me, twirling around in a chair, jumping, picking things up. It was absolutely amazing. And I, I knew that this was going to be a challenge. I mean, I knew, to say the least, it was going to be a challenge. But I also knew, just from the hint she was giving me, that the kid was in bad drug trouble. Uh... You taste it, um, a slightly different taste, white or brown. There's a, a warmth that goes through the body. There's a, a feeling of, of deep heat in all the muscles that, especially if one is in need, each muscle is untied, relaxed, one by one. Um, a capability creatively to um, be open to the four winds, to synchronize thought, to uh, think many things at once. There's definitely a physiological reaction in the brain that stimulates this. It, is, it has to do with the fear of flight syndrome and so forth when you're in danger and things slow down. That's that same, uh, that same response and the way you think so clearly and of many things at once, that's also part of it. I remember, um, you know, um, having other junkies tell dealers, you know, watch out for her. 
because she's never going. You're never going to be able to give her enough, and um, and there there was never enough. Every single cell in the body has a little niche that needs heroin. That is the cells in the toes, in the nose, in the fingers, in the heart, in uh, the eyes, in the ears, everywhere. Um, when a model is a commodity, it, it, they'll use anybody till they're used up. And it's not just models, it's editors, photographers, hair and makeup. That's the nature of the business. In other words, it's everything for the picture. Yeah, everything for the picture, for, for what the magazine wants. Her agent should have smacked her ass into a rehab and kept her there in a halfway house and sat on her instead of collecting those fucking commissions. I keep thinking, what else could I have done? What could I have done? But it wasn't for me. I did what I could do, and that was it. What everybody else wanted her to care about, which was that she was screwing up her career, is the part she didn't care about at all. That could not have mattered less to her. Um, I think the most telling thing that I got out of that session, for me, the thing that was going to carry forward from that point on the most was how, how much she disliked what she did for a living. Um, she said at least four or five times just in that, that second session that she felt like a fake, a fraud, that she felt like she was stealing money for doing what she did because it wasn't who she really was, they didn't know who she really was. That came through a lot too. And I realized that this drug for this kid was perfect. It was like the perfect match of the person and the drug because it allowed her to do what she had to do, the thing that she liked doing so little. It allowed her to numb herself sufficiently to get through what she saw as basically a bullshit thing to do with bullshit people. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a state of, of neither consciousness or unconsciousness. She thought, okay, this is cool, I'm feeling numb now, you know, I can do this. They can do what they want with me today and I don't care. She didn't have a great sense of humor and she did not want to look foolish. And a lot of times when you do these TV commercials, they've got you, she used to say, I'm not going to be jumping out of a washing machine. What are they going to do to me today? She was very careful about her image and she wanted her image because that was really all she had. What do you think killed Gia? People like Gia in this world there's not much anyone can do to help them. They're just gonna die away and not be here anymore. And I guess it's the fault of the world and all of us and not them. I don't put the blame on them. I mean, the only time I ever felt the same way was with Janice Joplin when I spent just an afternoon with Janice. But I spent many afternoons with Gia and many evenings with her. And uh, there was something there that you just fell in love with. Do you think she was happy being so beautiful? No, I think her beauty really got in her way. Uh, the very, very first time I was doing a Maybelline commercial with her, way before we had the affair. And um, she was so beautiful. Everyone just come over and go, oh my God, look how beautiful she is and everything. She's walking this puppy dog in this Maybelline commercial and everything. And just for conversation's sake, she's sat down next to me and I said well how'd you get started and she went through this long thing about how my mother convinced my aunt and all this and that and it was like she never really wanted to, she was trying to tell me a perfect stranger she never really wanted to be here but here she was and it was way different than what she expected are you happy with your success um yes I am I am you hesitated well, I just wanted to think about it. No, I am happy with it. She was one of those people who was really verbose when she was high on heroin, by the way. A lot of people are not she was. She seemed to be able to speak and think more clearly when she was high than not. Um, and so she told me more about herself, about the hoagie shop, and about growing up in Philadelphia, and da 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 So I had more of a sense of where she came from, more of a sense that this was really like the all-American kid that I was dealing with here. But what came through to me so loud and clear was that she was really scared to death. She knew that something was happening in her life. And she was in free fall. That's exactly where she was. She was in free fall. Um, and she actually asked me to help her. It is like taking a hallucinogen 24 hours a day that is very, very subtle. 
Uh, it was no longer, well, will I or won't I use this week or today or whatever? That was gone. So it, it was, was no longer in her control? No longer in her control. And she all. sensed that? And she sensed that. She sensed it clearly. I mean, she, she as much as said that out front, that she, uh, you know, she said, I know that when I walk out of this building, well, first of all, she said, you know why I was late. I said, of course, I know we were late. Now I know why you were late. Uh, and she said, you know where I'll go when I leave here? And I said, yeah, of course, I know where you'll go when you leave here. Um, it was beginning to control her life all the time. The only time that she wasn't thinking about going to get heroin was when she had just done some. It's a very, very subtle thing, heroin, extremely subtle. Um, I think William Burroughs said that uh, as opposed to cocaine, in which you shoot cocaine, goes up in your head, it's a rush, it's very clear, it's brutal. Uh, for heroin, you have to listen. Everything in your body, you know, needs it and wants it, and everything in your mind needs it and wants it. I mean, heroin, uh, you know, is like a giant buffer you know it just softens everything it, it's like a piece of cotton between you and life and um, I, I remember when when I would kick things being so clear you know painfully clear like almost I would feel almost like things were three dimension you know like I had 3d glasses on all of a sudden they were just so clear and I I liked the haze that heroin put around life and um, I just didn't feel sad I didn't feel afraid um, the only thing I felt afraid of was running out when the junkie is in need the pain of life is felt with an indescribable intensity by every single organ and every single part of the body. And this means um, strange electrical cramps in all the joints of the body, every single one, the little finger, the knees, the back, the neck, the arms. That is suicidal. I think that the thing that hit me the most clearly was that she was scared of what she was doing. Total insomnia uh, for months, really. And you know that's ahead of you. Um, and no, nothing will take care of that insomnia. Um, in addition, um, all the symptoms of basic sickness, that is to say, your nose runs, you cough, you have fits of sneezing, you cry, uh, your eyes just cry. Um, your eyes are very dilated, all light hurts. The fact that she was frightened uh, betrayed everything else that she was trying to give me in terms of her, you know, devil may care attitude and the whole Gia act that she was trying to throw my way. Headache, stomach ache, diarrhea, vomiting, vomiting until you're vomiting green and yellow goop because there's nothing left in your stomach and you're vomiting the chemicals and lining of your stomach. Um, hideous totally hideous like you want to die she looked terrible she was very skinny very dark circles under her eyes white 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 face which can be attractive but it wasn't terribly attractive we did a lot of pictures in a limousine where Arthur Elgore the photographer kept her mostly in shadow I mean you could see it was Gia her mouth and her body language there was clearly some kind of a bond developing between the two of us and um, uh, I think that it, it was much more based upon Gia's need to feel as though she was fighting this demon than it was any real kinship that she felt with me. She definitely related to the fact that I had been through this. I mean that made her feel safe. The fact that I had been through this and knew what she was talking about uh, made her feel like she was being heard when she talked to me. But I think that what was really compelling her was that she wanted to feel like she was making an effort to fight this thing. So some of the sessions were very good because of that. Um, then it got to a point, and I would say that this was probably a month and a half, maybe two months after the first time that I ever saw her. I got a call from her, and she told me that she was down on the street. Uh, now, I knew that that meant Rivington Street, which was a street in the Lower East Side that was infamous for being a heroin supermarket back at that time. Uh, and she asked me to come down there and get her. And I will tell you that in all of my professional life, I would have, 
I would have reacted to that with such derisive laughter. I mean, that was an insane idea. It's highly unprofessional. I, I think it borders on unethical, actually. But something about this girl really compelled me, and I, I agreed to do it. And I actually found myself taking the train and going down and in the middle of the, of, of the bowels of the Lower East Side. Uh, I, where she said she was going to be, she wasn't. That was the first thing. So I'm walking around to these assorted drug dealers and, and whatnot types, and I'm familiar with the scene. I mean, I can speak the language, and I can kind of ingratiate myself. Uh, who I was asking for was obvious that they weren't seeing too many people who fit that description every day down there. So finally a guy pointed me in the general direction of a shooting gallery. Uh, and I went in and I went from floor to floor and I got to like the third floor of this abandoned building. And not only was she sitting there shooting heroin, but she was wearing the clothes from a shoot. She was wearing like a gown. It was the most ludicrous juxtaposition you can imagine. Here are all these mostly minority drug addicts all in this heavy kind of nod and in the middle of them is this girl say i never forget it it was this pale blue gown like a, an evening gown sitting on the floor cross-legged injecting heroin into her arm i walked over to her and she was in such a deep nod that she was literally sitting there with it in her arm uh, unable to move and this is endorphin at your fingertips by your choice by your control injected direct into the bloodstream with an intensity that is more that is 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 greater than your body produces naturally tell me about the shooting galleries they're just abandoned um, like apartment buildings or hotels and you um, you know you have to get in um, and you, you you go up the stairs and uh, there's a you know uh, like the, I'll give you an example of the you know one of the ones I went to there there's an empty room and and the only thing that was in there was a bunch of dope fiends and and then there was a, a set of a chest of drawers and and um, and inside the drawers were a bunch of you know dirty old syringes and and you know spoons burnt spoons and cottons and and uh, you know if you didn't have your own set of works with you then you could use one of those and and um and you just went and you and you bought your dope and you got loaded there whenever she was in the middle of doing that the look on her face she was really transcendent that's the only word i can think of and when it stopped, you could just see there was this moment of real disappointment and sadness just kind of swept over her, and then she moved on about her GIA business. It doesn't speed you up. It doesn't slow you down. It just gives you the opportunity for everything to be a little bit different, a little bit enhanced. It does come, of course, from opium, which is a refined opium, which is, of course, a hallucinogen. I walked over. I took it out of her arm. I put it down. Picked her up, took her out of the building, and I got a cab and took her home. It was in my Fifth Avenue office, and she just showed up, and she looked pretty bad, and she asked me for a hundred dollars. And um, I understood that it wasn't good news, and uh, so, but I couldn't refuse her. So of course I gave her the money, and I said, well, you know, you obviously know what I would like to tell you and take care of yourself and she said yes yes I know and uh, I just said you know if you know I'm there if you need me and and that's all and and uh, uh, and I guess I never saw her after that uh, I I did the uh, the let's go downtown and rescue Gia routine a few times uh, probably more than a few um, and the last time that I went down and did that, uh, it was very much like that first scenario, very, very similar. The dynamic was really very, very similar. The only difference, of course, was that as soon as I got there, I knew where to go now. I mean, I, it was no problem about trying to figure it out or ask anybody. I just made a beeline right to the place. Um, and when I got up there, up to the floor, uh, she certainly wasn't wearing any ball gown. Um, she was spread out on the floor. And I remember this very small, wiry uh, Spanish woman was slapping her in the face vigorously back and forth and yelling, wake up, wake up. And I thought, oh, God, no, don't tell me. Is this really what's happening? 
And I, I went over and I went back and I looked down at her and she was just as overdosed as you could possibly imagine. I remember seeing cups filled with water with six or eight needles in the glass. There's so much that, that just about the needle itself that you're addicted to. If a junkie has heroin and no needle, the junkie will do anything to get the needle, will not imbibe it another way. The visual of it, the whole physicalization of the squeezing and relaxing, squeezing and relaxing, exactly while the drugs are hitting your brain and your cerebral cortex. Many, 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 many people shared needles in those days. Obviously, Gia did as well. She also had unprotected sex. Was there a lot of sex for drugs? Oh, yeah. There was. Yeah. Definitely. The response of a bunch of heroin addicts to you overdosing is usually to take you out and drop you in the street and run as fast as they can. Uh, they, they aren't really uh, you know, infamous for being uh, compassionate and, and uh, altruistic at moments like that. Uh, and I think if I hadn't been there, that's exactly what they would have done. First of all, what they were saying about her at the time, which was a, another one of those extraordinarily bizarre juxtapositions, is they were saying things like greedy bitch never does know when to stop now i had heard that about her before from the addicts down there um that even uh, among addicts gia's appetite was extraordinary they were amazed that such a little girl could get down there with that much money buy that much heroin and do it all and not die what can I say? yeah let's get a shot of me and you here I'm still in shape, everybody. I'm still alive, and, uh, you know, can I say? Okay, let me do it. Let me do it in you. Let me check it out. Come on. How much money are we talking about? She would go down... There were weekends when she would go down and run through 2500 bucks. Whatever life had to offer, Gia wasn't, wasn't getting what she needed. She was almost mournful. It was, it was sad to see her, and you could feel that, that deep sadness penetrating her whole life. I just think she was lost. I just think she was really lost. She was scared. It, it always looked like she was scared. Sandy, do you know if Gia believed in God? I did have a feeling that she believed in God, but it's just a feeling. It was, I felt she was spiritual. I convinced a couple of the women to stay with her while I ran and tried to find, you never find a phone that works in those neighborhoods. So I could find a phone that worked and call 911 and get somebody there, get an ambulance there. Uh, and that's what I did. I ran downstairs and I ran a few blocks this way and that way. By the time I got back up, one of the girls had, had given Gia a, a, a shot they used to give people shots of salt water or milk, and I have no idea why that worked on any level. Medically, I still to this day don't know why it worked. If it was that or just a slapping in the face or whatever, but she was starting to come around. And when I told her that an ambulance was coming, she woke up very, very quickly and insisted that we get out of there and that we were going away because she didn't want to be found out by, you know, whatever, which is exactly what we did. Uh, we went, we ran out. She was awake enough to be on her feet. We got out of there, we got in the cab, and we left. And in the cab, I told her, don't ever, ever, ever call me again to come down here. This is the end of that. I will never do this again. I'll see you. I'll talk to you. I'll do whatever you want to do. But this I will never do again. And I, and I held to that. Did you see her again after you found out that she was HIV positive? No, no. Uh, I never saw her again. And I don't think she wanted to see anyone. If she had called for me to come and see her, I would have gone running. But I didn't see her. I just... And then I just heard that she had died. And, uh, you know, it's a very, very sad, tragic story. There's so many drugs in our food. You know, people take drugs every day and they don't even know it. But so, you, you don't have, if you don't mind me saying it, you really don't have... Well, of course I mind you saying it. <laughs> you don't have cocaine and heroin in food, I mean... Well, you never know. <laughs> I mean... She would somehow get into my building, go to the penthouse, scale the outside of the building. I was up 10 stories, so she was on the 11th floor. She would scale like Superman, or like she thought in her mind, Romeo and Juliet. She would scale the outside of the building and land on my air conditioner in the bedroom. And once I was with a guy that I had been seeing on and off, and she landed on the air conditioner. This is the first time she had did, 
did it. And I see these white sneakers land on my air conditioner, and I fainted. I knew who it was immediately, and she was outside of the, the, the bedroom. It was way more than I could tolerate, way more. And she did it two other times. She did it three times. She would man, and I, I took the, the doorman. I said, you cannot let this girl in the building. She had a way of charming them or sleezing in and out, you know. Um, but that was way more than I could take. That was a little too much. And I fainted, but my boyfriend looked at me like, aren't you going to help her? Aren't you going to help her? And he opened the window, and they were these windows that pulled out like this, so it was hard to get her in. And he managed to get her in. And she plopped herself down on the bed and threw her legs up, and she looked like she belonged there. And what the fuck was he doing there in my bedroom? She gave him a dirty look. I said, what would have happened if we didn't get you in this room? You, you could have fallen. What would have, oh, she said, I would have kicked open another window. But I got into this deep inside that I tried, but it won't let me go. Liked Gia? I liked her a lot, but she caused me a lot, a lot of pain and and aggravation constantly. I mean, I would be all up and in a great mood, and I would say, Gia, I have tickets. We're going to Florida. We're going to Key West. We're going to this great place. What'd you do that for? I mean, can you become hooked on modeling as you can become hooked on drugs? No, I doubt that very much. Um, but I, you know, all things, you can take all things as drugs. I mean, anything's a drug if you take it, you know. It's not good to take things too much, you know, because then they don't seem to be worth as much. Where she took me in terms of the human mind and what goes on, I mean, I'm sure that if I had known then what I know now, I certainly could have seen that she was, at the very least, bipolar. She was certainly in need of some... Maybe if she had been diagnosed and properly medicated at some point, this whole thing wouldn't have happened. She might be alive to this day. That's entirely possible. My friend Jimmy and I, who knew Gio also, uh, we were at a house that I had out in Pennsylvania. Um, and we were just talking about this, that, and the other thing. And then we started to talk about Gia. For no apparent reason, we had no idea why the subject came up. But we talked about her, we reminisced, we told some stories and so on. And then it kind of went away. Uh, and then Jimmy called me about two weeks later and told me that he had found out that almost at exactly the moment that we were having that conversation about Gia, she was busy dying in the hospital. I'll never forget it. I was standing beside of her bed and one of her doctors at that moment called on the phone and I talked to him and we had already decided that that's probably what, what, how she was going to be diagnosed and uh, we just went on from there I mean uh, it was horrendous she had been clean from the time that she went through the rehab program and then she had gone and sold her car and uh, I think she she might have been intentionally trying to kill herself because she was in Atlantic City for about a week and it wasn't going right. It was it was very bad. I was getting a lot of phone calls and I said, when Gia's ready to come home, she will call me. And then I got the call from her father and he said, you know, she's really messed up. And I said, well, you know, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, she's supposed to come back, and I'm going to put her on a bus and send her back to you. So the next day, she came in his store, and uh, they called me on the phone, and I made her promise 
that if I met her at the bus, she would go straight to the hospital with me. And I took her to the hospital. She was an absolute mess. Uh, couldn't walk straight or anything. Uh, there was no way I could take her home because I couldn't handle her in the condition she was in. I didn't know what I was going to be in for. And she obviously was more than just on drugs. I was home alone and the doorbell rang, uh, which was odd because I have a doorman and I usually get buzzed first. Especially I'm a little paranoid and I need to know the buzzer, who's coming up and this and that. Anyway, it was the doorbell, but I said, uh-uh. And I opened it up, and she was there looking gorgeous. I mean, looking like probably the first day I'd ever seen her. And all cleaned up, beautiful hair, beautifully dressed, cashmere, beautiful coat and everything. And she just smiled very quietly. It was a different Gia. And she walked into the... And I let her in because I could tell she was cool, okay? I could tell she wasn't high, I guess. And she just walked in the apartment and sat down on the couch. I sat down next to her. I said, hi, how are you? What's happening? You know, and she put her head on my chest and she just sobbed. And my whole uh, shirt was dripping wet from tears. And she never spoke to me. I just kept trying to... Uh, figure out what she was doing in the city. I must have been asking her all kind of ordinary, simple questions. And um, she just looked at me and she said, I got to go now. And she left. And piecing that together with what I know now about how the time period that she was sick and everything, I'm sure she knew she was sick. And she looked good for that day. And she was going to say goodbye to me, looking good. She was never really well. Again, that was in June. Uh, right after she came out of the hospital, we took her to Great Adventure. And she got very weak, very, very fast. And she said to me, she says, Mommy, she says, I know that I couldn't go to Disney. I, I just wouldn't be able to do it. She wanted to go to Disney. And I had told her if she got well enough, we would take her. But there was no way, and she knew it. And it started to rain, and I got very, very concerned about her. And uh, she, she told me, like she always did, oh, Mommy, uh, what would I do without you? And then uh, she was home more than she was anywhere else. And then we were trying to work on some of the problems that she had, the physical things that were happening to her body. And then uh, we had to put her in the hospital. She went in on a Friday. On Sunday night, they put her on full life support. When she left, I had no idea that this was her goodbye. I had no idea I'd never see her again. She called me after that time. She called me once. Once that I remember picking up the phone and I heard a voice and she said to me, Sam, are you afraid of me? And I... I said, no, I'm not afraid of you. I've never been afraid of you. And I slammed the phone down on her. Of course, I was, I couldn't believe she was asking me, are you afraid of me because you think I have AIDS? She was sitting there breathing on her own, but she just, she just couldn't do it. And then after, I think they had her off for maybe 15 minutes. And they were trying to see how long they could keep her off while she could breathe on her own, but it didn't work. They put her back on and they were never able to get her off again. Halloween came at about two, two weeks into all this. And we celebrated Halloween. I mean, people thought we were nuts, but with Gia, you always celebrated the holidays and you always made a big thing out of them. So she had the pumpkins in her room and kitty cats and she had this big furry hand and the doctor came in and I think it was sad in a way but yet we were a family this was probably the last time we were ever going to have a holiday with her and we celebrated it even though it was like something crazy like Halloween the time when she said goodbye to me and she cried and everything I had nothing to regret because I didn't know anything but by the the last phone conversation that I slammed the phone down and, you know, don't bother me anymore kind of manner, I really do regret because 
She was trying to communicate with me. It wasn't just another high phone call. I had gotten 50 phone calls from her a day at times with her just being stoned out of her mind, and I was used to them. So I treated this like another high phone call, but it wasn't. It was the last time I'd ever hear her voice. Toward the end, they ordered a bed for her. It was special. They had somebody uh, come in, and each cushion had to be set up exactly by the technician from the uh, manufacturing company. And they thought that would make it easier for her. Whatever could happen to that body did happen. Whatever organ, whatever there was in it, failed. And I always thought very romantically, I thought, you know what, because we both loved St. Bart's and we'd been there together, I thought, you know what, Gia, one day I'm going to see you on the beach. I'll see you again. And I always had that idea in my mind. There was never, ever, ever a feeling that I wasn't going to see her again. Was Gia able to communicate with you while she was in the hospital, while she was on life support? Okay, while she was on life support, it, she was on for four weeks. The first two weeks were the better part of the time period, even though things were going wrong. And because she had all these ho tubes in her and in her throat and everywhere else and all these bottles with something hooked up to her, uh, we could communicate to, with her limitedly. Uh, she couldn't talk very well, but we would say things and because we knew her we would try to say what we thought she was trying to say and there was a time period when we would write things down and uh, if we weren't getting the right answer we would just write a series of people's names or a series of words and then she would point and she wanted to get the hell out of there and she thought if I would just take her home if I could would just help her get out the door everything would be fine and I would I would have to explain to her again and again and again that no if I take you even as far as the elevator you'll never make it and I would tell her we would have to take the oxygen and all this equipment and there's no way we could do that she was not going home and she we kept trying to like let her know that, that and you knew at that point that she would never go home again I knew that. When, when, when I saw what happened when they tried to wean her from the tube, I probably knew it before that. But uh, that kind of reinforced it, and it was just a matter of time. I wish I could see her again, sure. There's no doubt about it. I never, ever got the chance to say goodbye. Not really. I, just that one last memory, but... Um, no, this is my goodbye, because things sort of have to come a full circle. The last two weeks it was like it just went more and more and more and more downhill and uh, it got to the point where she was either drugged to the point that she was sleeping all the time or she was in a coma. She is an enormous chapter in my life. She is not just a memory. She is part of my life. She is part of who I am today. My sister was in the room with me, and they were washing her body and taking care of her, and they rolled her over, and I saw her back, and the flesh was literally falling off of her back. AIDS literally ate her alive. This is an assault. Making love all night long Take a bath in milk And lay on your satin sheets Let smile and play a while and chocolate mint
Oh. 